This week on Crossfeed. At the name of Jesus? Well, we'll just cover it up. Which homeless can be sheltered? The Miss USA scandal. And can a pastor be forgiven? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Crossfeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. And we have again with us our guest host. Hello, I'm Joe Burnham, and I am the assisting pastor at St. John's Lutheran here in Denver, Colorado, and a uh, guy who does other weird stuff like the Glocal Family Podcast. I listened to the first half of it. I haven't listened to all of it yet. It's pretty cool. He got the guy that started uh, um, uh, Earth Day. Yeah, he's actually a member at St. John's, so that, that made it oh, a little that... bit easier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, you know, I was absolutely shocked because, like, every time I hear about Earth Day, I hear about all these, you know, like Gaia and, you know, all this sort of, you know, environmental religion kind of stuff. And so yeah. I, I just kind of figured that the guy that – um that founded it must be into all that kind of stuff. And now here he's a, he's a LCMS Lutheran has some odd doctrinal stuff. His dad actually helped launch a, a Pentecostal denomination when he was a child. His dad was a roaming evangelist, but uh, yeah, faith is, uh, is huge in his life. And it was actually a, a major uh, contribution behind him launching earth day. And one of his greatest disappointments, we had a, an event at the church last night um, where we were talking about some things about how can we be, um, you know, better at, at our stewardship of creation. And, uh, and he was talking a little bit and he talked about one of his greatest frustrations and disappointments was the fact that, that the church never got behind him and, and never saw this as part of a, what we do in, in as a way of honoring what God has given us in, in the planet. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I can, I can see that being frustrated. Huh? So global so, family.com. Check it out. Yep. Right. So where are we going to begin this week? Oh, um, oh, let's start out in California or, well, All right. Miss USA. You know, okay. I, I'm, I'm really, <clears throat> this whole thing is really bugging me because I do not watch pageants. I mean, I actively avoid them. And so, I mean, I was not aware of this until it hit the news. <laughs> You know, it's fine. I didn't even know about it until I read the article for this podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I missed it even on the news. I, I, I limit my news consumption just enough to get the highlights, yeah. and, and this didn't make the highlights. You know, it was just – I'm I'm trying to figure out why it's bugging me so much because I don't care about anything – Um, you know, when – I mean, people say all kinds of stupid things that – you know, I mean, no offense to anybody that's into pageantry, but – you know, I, it's like most of the stuff that's said is, is, is pretty inane and, you know, I'm for what was it a couple and, years you know, ago where it was, you know, miss, I forget what, it, what state she was from, but why are Americans so bad at geography? Well, I think it's because us Americans don't have maps. Yeah. <laughs> and if we just had oh, yeah, maps. Yeah. So that was, I mean, it was, uh, was huge on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you but know, yeah. So for those of you who don't know what happened, uh, Miss California um, was asked about uh, marriage rights and, and stated that she believed that, that marriage uh, should only be between a man and a woman. And, and that was just sort of – she's like, I don't want to offend anybody, but that's how I was raised. That's what I believe. That's what I think. And, um, and uh, apparently a lot of gay men watch pageants. Um, and they were incredibly upset. And it was actually in, in the article that we have here. It was talking about, um, you know, one of the guys' examples was, "Hey, <laughs> take a look at the look at the population. Look at the people who are here at this pageant. Uh, how many gay men are here?" Um, and, and so it was this big argument that then flowed out of it about was it right of her to express her belief that marriage should be between a man and a woman, or is uh, is that somehow um, not allowed in the context of the pageant? Right. And it, I mean, it's further complicated by the fact that all right, she was given this question randomly, but the person that the the judge who was um, given the question to ask her was Perez Hilton, who is a celebrity blogger and who's also openly gay. 
And so, um, and he, while the judges are not allowed to say what scores, what individual scores they gave to um, different ones, um, he s- expressed something to the effect of um, he was deeply disappointed by her answer or something like that. All right. So, and, and basically the, the speculation, and it seems pretty likely that it was, it wasn't the, the, the quality of her answer, but actually the, um, position that she took, um, that lost the competition for it because she, and was she ended up finishing second. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so, and I guess the thing that bugs me about this so much, I mean, you know, honestly, if she had lost it because, you know, I, I, I didn't think that if, okay, if you're going to, oh, okay, for, <laughs> sorry. All right. First of all, I don't think that this question even belongs in the competition. All right. Don't ask people highly polarized, um, uh, political questions, you know, ask them what they would do to bring world peace or something like that, you know? Um, and then to, um, I, I thought that her answer was, I mean, I I don't know if she knew what all the possible questions were and I don't think she did. Um, it, it would have been nice if she gave a little more reason answer than basically, well, my mama says it's wrong. So, you know, that's what I'm yeah. going with. Well, and I was going to say, that's one of the things that I picked up out of this, that, that we as Christians really need to be aware of in this context. Um, and, and just when I pointed out this, this article that my, my wife, uh, tonight she saw and she said, Oh, she's now going to be presenting at the Dove Awards. Uh, and, and so the, the Christians have embraced her because of this, this great answer that she gave. But, but really the, the answer that she gave, yes, it expressed the Christian viewpoint, but it didn't give any, uh, fundamental reason behind why. Right. Um, and, 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 and I don't know later on one of the other, uh, in the article here, it talks about one of the other contestants, moms gave the whole, well, God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve arguments. And, but for, for people who don't hold the Bible as authoritative, for people who, who aren't going to listen to what the Bible says and respond and go, Oh, I should do that. We need to actually articulate our position from outside of a biblical perspective. Now we can start talking about things like, well, we believe that the foundation of, of the family and what results in the healthiest children is, is, a, is a husband and a wife and, and, and they're together and they're married and that results in the healthiest children. Therefore, it's the healthiest piece for a building block of society. Uh, and we can point to research that talks about the importance of having a mother and a father at home. Um, we can, we can point to, uh, other times and places where, uh, people in other cultures discerned this and, and intentionally made a big deal about it. Um, China just a few years ago insisted that if, if a, a U.S. couple was going to adopt a, a Chinese child, it had to be a man and a woman who were physically healthy, who had been married at least five years, and they had this whole other litany of requirements. Why? Because they wanted the best context to raise children in, and they didn't want Chinese children growing up in, in, in you know, less than ideal homes or is less than, you know, desirable homes. Um, you can even go back in history uh, and go to um, Caesar Augustus uh, about – what was it? About 20 BC, um, he started passing the Lex Julia laws uh, after his daughter Julia and they were all built um, – to keep women who had just recently become property owners and who are stout, now starting to live these ostentatious lifestyles and having these open and illicit affairs and getting back alley abortions and living uh, in, in just sort of wild and crazy, hey, I don't have to care about my husband kind of ways. He created laws to sort of rein them in because he realized that the foundational building block of the Roman Empire was the family. And, and to keep the women and the husbands together so they could raise the children and have the children, he realized that was what was best for society. Um, and, and so if we can begin to discuss and, and, and make arguments from, from that perspective and that point, at least we have, you know, something that you can't really, I mean, there, A, it's, it's, you know, so, Engaging in debate, it's engaging in conversation, but it's also doing it at a place where where everyone's going to can you know agree with our source content. Right, right. You know, um, a, a friend of mine who's an atheist says, "You do not have 
the right to your own opinion. You have the right to an informed opinion. And, you know, especially if we're actually going to say, this is what I believe and why I believe it. As soon as you say, this is why I believe it. Yeah, you've got to have some kind of, you know, people aren't necessarily going to agree with you. But you can at least, you know, show some respect for um, for the other person's position and, and try to, you know, sort of meet them where they're at. Yeah. Um, of course, we also need to keep in mind that she is not, um, you know, a theologian or an apologist or a family systems uh, I was gonna say, counselor or anything. How many guys can rattle off what I just rattled off? Right, can right. Anyone, anyone want to guess that I live in right between Denver's two largest gay communities? <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, she's a beauty queen, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not her brains that got her where she's at, you know, <laughs> Miss America is about brains. Come on, Dale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is why they have the swimsuit picture of her up on the side. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, and, and I think ultimately it comes back to your initial point. There's there's the side where we as Christians can think about how we approach it. But really, does that question even belong um, in, in the context where it was presented? And is it really even healthy to have it there? Um, I think the other thing that's interesting is is there's this whole element of this argument for we need to be inclusive, and that's why we need to in, include the gay community in, in, in marriage and allow uh, – Men, uh, you know, same-sex marriage and all of this, and and in their attempts to be inclusive, they have now excluded somebody who disagrees with them. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, it's it's that whole definition of an open mind is anybody that agrees with me. Yeah, or is willing to change their opinion so that they do agree with me. And if you disagree with me, then you have by definition a closed mind. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I like I said, this is it's, it's just a beauty pageant you know i mean but at the same time it's just the i i it it's a symptom of what's going on in our society mm -hmm. you know right now it's beauty pageants and and it's just like what next i mean you know there's already websites i mentioned this on the show before um where you can go to a google map that shows all of the people that donated toward proposition eight and has their their names and the amount of money and here's their address yeah. So that you can go vandalize their homes. You know, I mean, and nobody's screaming about that stuff, you know? And, um, I, you know, this Adam and Steve thing, I wasn't real impressed with either, you know? Well, and, and, and the, and the Dove Awards picking her up and, and it just, it, it just, it doesn't do anything to, to communicate, to at least come to a point where, where both sides are expressing their opinions. Um, you know, do I believe two men can love each other? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do I believe two women can love each other? Yeah. Do I have have friends who are are in, in same sex relationships that have been together for a long time? Yeah. Um. But does that mean that that because they're capable of it that it's what's best in in society and in culture and and we need to you know figure out at least where we're we're making our argument and basing our argument from instead of just fueling opposite sides of the fire and getting each other to be raving mad at one another um at least we can have you know a healthy discussion and 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 maybe come to a place where we disagree with one another but we can still be friendly and like each other right so i i was i was real impressed with the the actual winner uh miss north carolina uh Kristen dalton um you know her uh, real intellectual statement about her win uh it feels really natural i've worked so um so hard to be here this has been my lifelong dream it's finally here and whoever knew you could win in a turquoise gown that See, sounds like a beauty pageant answer <laughs> And, and 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 there's the thing is you, you go from gay marriage to a turquoise gown. I yeah. mean, right. right. You need to ask him about world peace. Yep. <laughs> or maps. <laughs> so, oh, and and here is our, our official apology people. to any beauty queens who are now watching and or who were watching but aren't anymore. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we've we've offended a lot of people on this show over the past couple of years, and 
Um, Let's face it, beauty queens wouldn't be watching us anyway. <laughs> yeah, probably not. You know, but hey, you never know because we did a, a couple of years ago. Um, we did a show on um, on the Jedi religion, and um, the founder of the religion uh, contacted us and kind of took us to task, and we ended up having to apologize to him. So, you know, you just uh, never know <laughs> who's watching. Well, this America's going to come slam us now. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Miss USA. Miss USA, that's right. We've got to get the right one. Right. You need to understand, Miss America, there's talent um, competition. <laughs> Miss USA skips the whole talent competition because really, it's not about <laughs> oh, <wow>. talent. <laughs> you know, for someone who avoids these things, you seem to know a lot about them. <laughs> it was in the story. If you'd read it, you'd know that. <laughs> I avoided to an extent I didn't even read the entire story. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, let's go to Georgetown. All right. Transition. <laughs> I, I, transition We're going to go from, from the non-academic to community the to the academic community. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, President Obama was at Georgetown and uh, was speaking at the uh, at Gaston Hall which has a um, big right by the podium has a big gold monogram IHS or actually it's Iota Eta Sigma. Um, well, no, actually it's an S, but um, all right. Which for those who don't happen to know Greek um, is, or, or Greek shorthand actually, um, that is the first three letters of the name Jesus in Greek. Um, and so, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it goes back a long ways and it's the logo of the, um, the, the, the Jesuits. Jesuit, yeah. And the Jesuits founded Georgetown university. And so you see that logo in several places around Georgetown university. All right. President Obama was speaking there on the, the economy. And so, um, what the, they covered up the logo. Okay. Um, so, and the reason they covered it up is because basically if they didn't, or there's, there's two reasons. Number one, if they hadn't covered it up, it would have appeared like in every picture, uh, that anybody took just because of where it was, it'd be like kind of right over his head or something. Um, and, and would have been really obvious there. And, um, but they said, you know, whenever the president does a, a, a speech on, um uh what they say not policy this one happened to be the yeah policy policy speeches yeah. um you know they they use the same standard background backdrop of flags and pipe and drape okay and they just wanted the same standard backdrop you know and, and so they covered it up so it kind of got um you must be in control um cns news kind of broke the story and and it was a big deal to them that, um, oh, they're covering up the name of Jesus. Fear of a name only increases fear of the thing itself. I, <laughs> do you want me to go off or do you want to say something first? Oh, you can go first. <laughs> well, you know, I was <laughs> – well, at first, this made me go, okay, who is who is CNS News? And you, know, you go to their about page, and they talk about we we report on on issues over spin, which translates we just spin everything in the other direction. You know, at least you know I it wasn't exact. <laughs> you don't have to dodge anything here. They can't actually throw stuff no, at you. I was just <laughs> leaning to the right. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, just just a little le- right leaning there. But but I think the other thing is is the exact same people who published this single point about the fact that the, the name of Jesus was covered up. Given how everything would appear with the, the blue backgrounds and the flags, and then right over Obama's head, you would have had a little pyramid thing with the name of Jesus on it. They would have argued that he set it up that way so he could claim that he was Jesus, or it was his subtle claim that he was Jesus, and so they'd be ripping him into that and for, you know, ripping into him for that. Well, you know. So- uh, that's that's what I was thinking is that, um, you know, really it was probably good that they covered this up because there's enough confusion about whether or not he's the savior of mankind or not already. You know, people 
people, you know, President Obama, Jesus Christ, people get them confused. You know? <laughs> so, so, boy, you know, this would be like, you know, when you go to school and and the name is the, of the kid is right on the desk, you know, and yeah. like that, you know, people would get, oh, well, there you go. You know, <laughs> And yeah, and then I was looking, and they have the, a connection story to it, and it wasn't covered up when Laura Bush spoke there. Um, never mind that she had an entire different stage set up, and you can see pretty much the entire background of the building when she's speaking. It wasn't like he would have just had this little pyramid over his head, and you know, the only thing that could have been worse is this man claims he's or this man's this king of the Jews, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, it was. I I, I guess. Part of it, I just look at it and it, it feels to me like somebody who is really, really desperate for a story. Well, they were trying pretty to come excited up with that it made it to that, the Drudge Report. So. Yeah. So I just – I looked at it and it was just – why don't you complain about, OK, his his approach to economic policy that he was talking about there that night? I mean if if, if there's where your objection lies, argue against him there or argue, you know, argue against – Something that he's done. <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, this was just standard White House protocol. Um, now, I, I do – I actually do object to one thing um, that he did, and that was tying in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, it was, it was absolutely horrible exegesis. <laughs> I have yet – and I haven't listened to all of President Obama's speeches, okay? So somebody can call me out on this one. But – I have yet to hear him actually use any part of the Bible in its proper context. He quotes well, it say. on a regular basis, but usually the stuff that he's quoting is is very, um, you know, what I would call religious, you know, uh, which sounds redundant, but, um, you know, not the sort of, you know, there are like social justice things in the Bible, okay, um, and, and things like that. But he'll take something where Jesus is specifically talking about God and our relationship with God, and he'll use it for something that has absolutely nothing to do with that. Yeah. And well, and if you think back to it, um, probably the, the previous you know, best speaker president that we had, you know, as far as best just orator, um, you know, the guy can give a good speech. Obama can give a great speech. He knows how to work a crowd, all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. The, the other guy that could really do that recent, in recent history was Clinton. And, and Clinton was the exact same way. He was he would, did a great job of weaving scripture into his in, into his speeches, but never in context. Um, but it, it 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 sort of promoted that spirituality, religious sort of thing. <laughs> Desperately trying to get the evangelical boat, you know. Well, I don't even I don't even think it's so much that. I think it's just grabbing into the, the poetic nature of the text and and being able to pull for you know. Sort of like quoting a good poem or something, you know. Yeah, yeah. Which I'm which right. is irritating for me as a pastor because I I place so much value on context and 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 that these words mean something that these words have power and and when I when people hear these words I want them to think about, um, you know, what they're actually speaking about as opposed to some sort of wishy washy economic thing. You know, so it's that that is frustrating whenever that happens. Um, well, yeah. So I and I remember I, I was actually I I try and watch a fair amount of the stuff that they crank out through YouTube and other sources that Obama puts out just just to stay on top of what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and it's true he he does he's very very good at weaving in scripture out of context. Um, I was I was actually I. The, the DNC was here in Denver um, this year, and uh, I, I do anything and everything I can to work in my community um, and volunteer in my community just because it's ways for me to break down walls and connect with people that I wouldn't otherwise connect with. You know, I, I live in a neighborhood that's 93% not Christian, and, um, and so for me to be able to get involved and connect with people is, is huge. It's, it, that's my way of, of – Opening the doors to evangelism, and uh, and so I volunteered for the DNC, um, and it worked out that I ended up in an apartment where I had I was I had field passes the night of the uh, 
the acceptance of the nomination speech. So I was standing right behind the delegates watching the speech from there. And, and, and the guy can, the guy can talk, um, in person on TV, but, but yeah, he not good at, um, at incorporating, uh, uh, sound interpretation into his use of scripture. Yeah. So yeah, you, you want, um, you know, a good, uh, understanding of what the, Scripture is talking about um, either either go talk to your pastor or just go read it in context and you'll get a much better idea of you know. Although it it does beat well, I think it beats Al Gore because Al Gore not too. I remember hearing him do one during his his presidential run against Bush um, when he talked about uh, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. But he. he how did he, he – he misquoted. He, he got everything in the wrong order and applied it to caring about creation. And if, 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 if our heart's in creation, then we'll invest in creation or something like our environment, oh. then we'll invest in – I mean it was, <laughs> it was just universally bad. <laughs> it was the, the exact opposite practically. Exactly. He said the exact opposite of what Jesus was saying. <laughs> well, Okay. Uh. Yeah, you got to cut him some slack. He invented the internet. Without him, we wouldn't be able to do this. Exactly. <laughs> Although it was sort of funny that the night of the, uh, I never realized how how big of a man he is. Al Gore is is a big dude because because the night of of the Obama's acceptance speech, I, I was walking around and I almost plowed over Tipper. <laughs> <laughs> and Al was right next to her. I came around a corner, and all of a sudden she was there, and I almost walked right over her. <laughs> and Al was, and I was just like, I was just a bit stunned because of how <laughs> he's just this big dude. I'm like, dang. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so um, are we going to talk about uh, we're we're going to talk about criminals one way or another now? Yeah, which way do you want to go? <laughs> Are we going to talk about the the home the homeless not being welcome in a in a church or a, a killer pastor being welcome in a church? <laughs> well, that's ironic, isn't it? Um, yeah. Want to start with the homeless? Sure. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, this is in Seattle, in various uh, neighborhoods in Seattle. Um, basically, there's I mean, there's a lot of details that aren't going to really matter to anybody that's not in Seattle. Uh, but basically, it comes down to this. Um, they're running out of homeless shelters. A lot of homeless shelters, just because of the economy, um, that are shelters that are hosted by churches, are closing. Or they're saying, look, you've got to move the shelter somewhere else. We just can't afford uh, to keep them here. And um, so they're looking for places to go. Well, some churches, um, and there's one in particular here, um, happens to be a Lutheran church, um, said, okay, we'll do it, but you've got to run a background, sex offender background checks on anybody that's going to be staying here. And the uh, cooperative organization that organizes um, all these different shelters said, no, no, we don't do that. Um, we uh, basically, I, they said, um, they they see it as an invasion of privacy and a violation of the screening policies that um that they've had for oh they've got 15 shelters in two tent cities and um they said you know we just we don't do that um i it was kind of an odd quote he said we told them we have 19 years of experience screening people downtown um we pretty much know how to judge people and i thought well i mean i yeah i mean you know i i'm sorry but I cannot look at a person. I mean, put it this way: there's people that uh, you know that have gotten themselves into trouble that I would have never imagined. You know, because I, I'm I wouldn't say it could happen to anyone because different people are tempted in different ways. Um, at the same time, there's no way that by looking at somebody, um, or or you know even um, uh, doing, you know, asking them a series of questions or anything that you can necessarily tell. All right. At the same time, this brings up the big question of, are you going to shelter someone 
who has committed some horrible crimes in the past. You know, are they, um, do they deserve to have a roof over their heads at night? Well, I think the other quote, this is, my mind ended up shifting over to the idea of, do you screen everybody who comes into your church? I mean, do you do you assume that because there, there's going to be a higher percentage of sex offenders among the homeless population, or you know what is it? The, the vast majority of sex offenders actually know the people personally that they are that they are offending, and so they're they're people that you see every day and on a regular basis and have a connection and a relationship with. It seems to me like you should you know be more concerned about the dude in the congregation who likes hanging out with the youth. As as opposed to the homeless people that are that are staying in in, in the shelter below, um, and so it it just there there was a point there where yes I, I I disagree that you can tell what somebody is like just by looking at them, but for that much that reason all that much you know more so uh, what about everyone in your church you know um, my uh, you know just just a, a, a Story on this. One of my groomsmen at my wedding um, is currently in prison for 15 years for multiple counts of uh, statutory rape. You know, would you ever assume or guess um, that that would be the case? And 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 it's not just like I'm the only person that's happened to. In fact, I'm not the only person in my family. My my dad's best man did time in in prison for rape. Um, It's just one of those. People that you don't know, people that you like, people that you trust, um, they end up doing that stuff because they have this secret double life. Mm-hmm. And, and and so to say just because these people are homeless, um, you know, I I struggle to say for that reason you need to be screening them. Yeah. Um, do I say you need to have them in in supervised c- contexts? Absolutely. Sure. Um, you know, do you do you make sure that you have program leads that are watching over them? Do you? Um, I would say you even you engage in relationship with them and and connect with them and figure out how else you can serve them. Um, but in the process, you can sort of watch what's going on and make sure everything's kosher. Um, so I, I think there's ways around that to a certain extent. You know, don't let them be alone with kids. Sort of like anyone at your church. Yeah, and this is particular specifically the the. Um, shelter that they're talking about is a men's shelter. Um, these are basically the same group of like what 19 guys or something like that, um, you know, that have been staying together um, in the shelter wherever the shelter has moved to uh, for a while now. You know. Yeah. So it's it's not like you're throwing them in with kids or, you know, or even men and women together, you know, or, or, you know, these are, these are people that presumably sort of trust each other, you know? And, um, this, this reminded me of something that happened to me about, was it this past winter or the, I think it was just this past winter. Yeah. It was like, yeah, maybe it was last year. I can't even remember now, but it was like two days before Christmas. We had this horrible snowstorm. I mean, the whole, every, everything was just, nobody was going anywhere. And, um, we've got a truck stop in town. Uh, it's about the only business in town. Um, it has a couple other ones, but, um, it's the main business in town. And there were people that were stranded at this truck stop. And, uh, somebody, it was like three o'clock in the morning. I get this phone call and I was actually awake at the time. Um, cause it was almost Christmas and you know, I was up writing sermons and things, but, um, I, you know, I wasn't, you know, super lucid or anything. And, and, um, and it was somebody from the neighborhood that said, Hey, there's this family stranded down there. Um, you know, could you, could you know could you open up the church and, and give them a, a warm place to stay and and I'm really ashamed that I actually hesitated because like insurance liability you know and all this stuff like went through my head and I went and you know and, and I wasn't real awake to begin with and uh-huh. and I was like 
um, uh, you know, and I should have just said, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, even if I have to like go there and stay there with them or, you know, whatever, you know, that, yeah. that's, you know, that should be a chance that we as a church, um, would be willing to take. And, um, and so, I, I mean, I did, I, we offered it to him and, and, um, I called up the, the sheriff department and, and said, um, you know, I, I'm not going to try to walk down to the truck stop and, and offer it to him, but uh, you know, if they've hit, they had squads out and stuff. And I said, if, you know, let them know that if they want a warm place to stay, um, overnight, you know, it's, we don't have beds or anything, but, um, you know, we can get some sleeping bags or something, you know, for them. And, um, and they ended up turning down the offer. They'd rather just stay in their car, which I thought wasn't very wise, but, you know, you can't force somebody, but yeah. I mean, you know, it's, there is that, that thing that, you know, that I'm not proud of. Um, but there's that fear of getting sued, that fear of something bad happening, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but you know, what it comes down to is we can't let that fear drive our actions. Well, and I think there's that there's the potential for something good happening as well. Mm -hmm. um, different situation, but but same kind of idea. Um, a number of years ago, I was doing youth ministry stuff and had a group of kids uh, with me down in Belize. Uh, we'd gone down there to do some some VBS stuff with kids down there and some other servant projects, uh, which is you know Central America it used to be British Honduras, so provide a little geography lesson there. Uh, for those who maps. might not know where Belize is, exactly maps. U.S. Americans are now better off because we have some maps. You can always Google it. <laughs> um, something better to look up than somebody who supported Prop Eight. Um, <laughs> but yes, these stories do all connect. Yep. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so we're down in Belize and. Uh, <laughs> Some of the kids and a few people who were heading up to camp to, to pick up some supplies and were coming back to the mission base that we were staying at. And all of a sudden, uh, somebody comes charging up and bolts into this main cabin room where I am and, and says, Joe, Leonard has a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Leonard is – I love Leonard. Leonard is, is wonderful. Um, but he was – at the time, I think he was a 15-year-old a kid. He has high-functioning autism. And uh, so Leonard is is not your typical socially functioning you know kid. He's 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 a bit unique, and yet we we included him in the group. I took him all over the place and did everything we could do with Leonard, and had a great time over the years with him. But um, I bolt out of this cabin and start heading down the beach there, and sure enough, Leonard has a, a twenty two rifle over his shoulder, and there's this stranger that's walking with the group. And it was this guy named Mark, uh, and he was a, a Russian Polak from San Francisco. <laughs> and it sounds like the setup for a joke. <laughs> but so he had had this gun, and what he was doing on this beach, I still don't know. Why he was there, I don't know. Why he had a gun, I don't know. Why he gave his gun to Leonard, I don't know. All I know is is that night we had this guy that this storm was coming in and, and, and the area that he'd been walking along, the beach was about eight feet wide and, and on on the east side was the ocean and on the west side was jungle. And we're not talking like, you know, little wimpy, prissy jungle. We're talking serious, hardcore jungle. There are things there that will kill him, jungle. Um, and, and so we couldn't let him stay out like out there at night. Mm -hmm. And and it was sort of like, well, what are we going to do? And so all of the youth that night, I uh, just make sure you you lock and block your doors and, and keep yourself so you're nice and safe. And I mean, it sounds like the setup for some sort of Friday the 13th type of episode. <laughs> but I just and, – and I ended up spending the night just talking with Mark. And and we were just up all night talking and I, I was listening to his story and, and hearing about him and getting to know him and – I still couldn't put together all the pieces, but we talked about faith, and, and he had no, no concept 
Um, and, and so we sort of worked with where he was at. And, and so we just continued to connect with us. And, and he ended up sticking with our group for the rest of that trip. Hmm. Um, and and he, so he went to vacation Bible school with us and was helping out with kids with crafts and stuff like that. He's hearing all of these gospel stories. He's connecting with these kids. We're able to to minister to him throughout all this process. When the trip ended, he actually stayed on board at the mission base and continued to work there, um, ultimately coming to faith. Wow. And so, I mean, the setup for this scary Friday the 13th type of slaughter horror movie, um, you know, 27 missionary kids and leaders get butchered and believes that, you know, <laughs> you know, sort of, you see the headlines coming up on it, but, but it ended up some guy becoming Christian and, and we get to spend eternity with Mark, um, simply because we welcomed him in. Yeah. Uh, you know, when, when everything in reason, then that night, you're going to get rid of this guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but God had something going on. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, you know, we were told at, at seminary, um, oh, and, and by the way, uh, people that are watching and listening, my internet has been kind of flaky lately. And so the, um, audio and video, it's getting a little, um, jumpy, but, uh, I think it's understandable enough, but if you're, if you're noticing that, that's what's going on. Um, anyway, um, where was I going? Um, they told us at seminary. Yeah. The, um, you know, they were, they were basically telling us things like, uh, you know, don't hug little kids, you know, and, and, and you know, it's this, this kind of stuff, like, you know, you gotta be so careful about everything you do. And, and yeah, you know, to, to some degree that's true, but you know what, if, if some little kid comes up to me and, and, and gives me a hug cause I'm her pastor and she knows that I bring the, you know, I bring Jesus to her and that, you know what, I'm going to hug her back and mm-hmm. I'm going to, you know, make sure that, uh, that there's, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I, try to keep other people around and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You know, when, uh, when I came to this church, uh, they didn't have an office at the, at the church itself. And, um, and, and they built an office and I said, make sure the office has windows, make sure that my office door has a window. Um, and it is placed such that anybody walking into the building, the first thing they see is, into my office window um, so that, you know, there's no question of any impropriety going on and things like that, you know, and you got to be careful of of all that stuff, uh, especially because of all the scandals that have been going on, uh, especially in the Roman Catholic church, but not just there. I mean, you know, um, anytime a pastor gets himself into um, some kind of troubles, being of these, you know, uh, secret double lives, you know, and, and the, the statistics are out there, uh, you know, People sort of, it's like, oh, he's a pastor. You can't trust him, you know? And, um, so you, you, you gotta and, be careful. And that stuff, that. it's very easy to get caught up in that, in that cycle, in that place. And, and, you know, to, to get, I mean, I remember, uh, I was trying to remember who, which, which prophet was, but talking about, you know, and, and it was, it was hilarious because I'm sitting next to my best friend who's about my height, but weighs about, 370 pounds and it's a big man and he and he talked about you know the the, the fear of, of women who might view you as a sex object as a you know, because you're the pastor and you you exemplify all the things they want their husband to be and and all this sort of stuff and and so i'm sitting next to this 370 pounders like yep i already knew that <laughs> you know it was it was one of those contexts where you know but but there, there's there's truth in that that uh, people are honest with you and they open up their lives to you and, and they lay it all out there and they're struggling and people are hurting. And, and if, if you're in the, the position where you look like you are the great guy who's, who's everything um, that, that, that either she wants or she wishes her husband was, or, you know, any of those, I mean, it's, you can see how quickly and easily you can get caught up in that and why you have to be there. Um, you know, mm-hmm. so yeah, but it's, 
But anyway, yeah. I'm not sure exactly yeah. how we ended up on that that particular <laughs> tangent. But back to the story. The the point is, is that um, yeah, you do have to be careful that because something bad could happen, and you know, you just you kind of got to be sensible about things. All right. You know, if if you're going to have people with little kids, then yeah, I mean, but not just whether homeless or not, I I would encourage all congregations to just mm -hmm. implement a policy um, to do background checks on anybody that spends time alone with kids, right? And you, and, and, you well, know... Times with kids and then don't allow anyone to spend time alone with kids. So it's always at least two adults per child if you can, if you can make that happen, if, if but run can. a background check on both of them anyway. Yeah. And, you know, and, um, you know, in some churches they'll say, well, we know everybody and, you know, they have, everybody grew up here or whatever. It's small church, small community and that. And you go, yeah, but okay, here's the deal. You know, you, that's why you put it in place now instead of waiting until somebody questionable comes along, mm -hmm. you know, and they go, oh, now we're going to put this policy in. It's like, what message are you sending? You know? Yeah. Like, oh, it's you. Well, and which is essentially what's going on here now. Ooh, we have the homeless people that are going to use our building. We better start running background checks on them. Right, right. But they weren't, you know, you know running them on anybody else, apparently. So, yeah. I mean. I, I, so we go to the, the potential of crime uh, coming into your church to the pastor who was a killer in his prior life. Yeah, yeah. Don't have to bother doing a background check on this guy. Uh, his name is Maury Davis. And uh, he is the pastor at Cornerstone Church in, I guess, in Madison, Tennessee. Are you a God-fearing man? And he spent what's, eight years in prison because he basically walked up to a woman and, for no particularly good reason, killed her in broad daylight. Slit her throat. The article kind of goes into some details that I'd rather not go into. Yeah. Um, but so here's the the sort of okay. He was he was in prison, and while he was there, he became a Christian, um, and uh, and eventually even ended up a pastor. Um, you know, at a church and he, um, he doesn't like talking about, you know, he, he does talk to people about God's grace, his mercy and, um, and he, but he doesn't really want to talk about the crime because, uh, he says the psychology of people is when things get too gory, they can't listen to the redemption part of the story. So he doesn't, he'll, he'll talk about it a little bit, but he won't name the victim he says, there's no benefit to them knowing the victim. I'm trying to make them understand their need to know God. Meanwhile, um, Ron Lyles is the son of the woman who was killed. And he's basically saying, look, this guy killed my mother in cold blood with no particularly, well, no reason at all, except that he was hopped up on drugs. But... Um, and so he got this tiny little sentence. He was set free because the prisons were overcrowded. Didn't even, you know, he got a, a 20 year sentence to begin with. And then that got cut down to eight and they just cut him loose. And he says, now he's, you know, he's a hotshot pastor at this church and, um, you know, living a comfortable life. The guy's making more than I am. Um, and they don't list it, but when they start talking about some of the stuff that he has, um, I don't have that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, he's, he's a pastor at a mega church and, uh, you know, and so it's, you know, it's kind of a rock star life to some degree. And, and this guy's, the son is saying, look, this guy, he's, you know, he's living it up. And he's doing it based on his testimony, which is all about what he did to my mother. And so basically, it's because of what he did to my mother that he is enjoying everything that he's enjoying today. So, you know, the, 
so it's the whole question of um, where does forgiveness happen? When does forgiveness happen? And how does forgiveness happen? And, and will it happen? Your hate has made you powerful. The son is, uh, he's a Baptist, he's a Christian, right? But he, and he knows that he should forgive the guy, but he's not particularly interested in forgiving him. He's, he's still, you know, very hurt uh, by the whole thing. Um, he thinks that's, that the guy's just basically a con artist. And, um... And so, you know, the question is how much, what, what do you do in a, in a situation like this? We're in trouble. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I mean, there's elements where it's like, I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. And I don't want to sit here and say the guy's a, a, a con artist and that he's, he's making bucks off of people. Um, but there's the same time uh, an element where there's there, there's something about it that that the whole setup where I feel just uncomfortable and 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 typically I'm not somebody who feels uh, discomfort with with you know people who have lived in extreme places and been through extreme things and done, that's <laughs> not my my norm <laughs> you know um, I don't know it, it's it's one of those odd stories where I, I feel sorry for the son. Um, who has been unable to um, release uh, Maury Davis and 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 forgive him in the sense of of letting go of his right uh, to to get even. You know, I, I think that's in, in essence what forgiveness is really all about. It's 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 about abandoning your right to get even. You know, whenever there's a crime is committed, it means that 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 something has been been destroyed, and and somebody has to pay to fix it. You know, if 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 I go into your house and break a lamp, we have two options. You can either make me pay to replace the lamp, or you forgive me that debt. Um, and until something happens, there's always tension there. And that means that the son is, is years later still has – I mean that's going to be eating away somehow in the midst of him. And, and, and so I feel sorry for him in, in that. Um, it seems to me that he's in a, in a, in a, a bad place be, because of that. At the same time, um, it's almost like Davis does a, enough to uh, – out of his ministry to um, to capitalize, I, I don't necessarily like that that phrase, but you know, in a sense, there's that there to, to capitalize on it without a being, you know, grossly overdoing it. I don't. It, it just seems like neither side is really right in the midst of this. Um, yeah, it's a, okay. You know, I always say when people come to me and, and talk about forgiveness, um, you know, what it comes down to is that. We as Christians, and this guy says he's a Christian, and I believe him, okay, um, have no reason not to, um, speaking of the uh, Ron Lyles, the, the son, okay? Yeah. But, you know, what I always tell people when they have a hard time forgiving is that, all right, when Jesus went to the cross, he went there to pay for all of our sins. And so, as far as God is concerned, that sin is forgiven. It's it's paid for. It's taken care of. The blood of the Son of God covered it, all right. And you know we're walking kind of a, a, a unhealthy, dangerous path when we say, well, you know what, God may have forgiven it, but I will not. You know, and it's and it's one thing to say I'm hurt, and and it's and I'm, you know, I I, I don't wish evil on this person but I still feel hurt every time I see or think about this person. All right. Fine. I mean, that's, there's not much you can do about that. I mean, that's just part of living in a sinful world. God can forget sin. We can't. Yeah. Um, but you know, this guy, he wants, you know, he wants to get even, he's not gonna, um, go hunt him down or anything, but, you know, he really, he's hes looking for justice. And My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Yeah, he's not, he's not seeing the justice. 
and there seems this uh, uh, Davis has a bit of uh, seems to have some confusion about um, you know about justice and this whole distinction here. Um, you know, they he sort of tongue in cheek says, "Well, you know, Paul was a murderer and he wrote the majority of the New Testament. Uh, Moses committed a murder. David was a murderer. If it weren't for inmates, you wouldn't have the best part of your Bible." All right, and you know. I mean, he's right, and you know, as 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 far as uh, and and Saint Paul's probably the best example of you know, here's someone that went around murdering Christians, and you know, he was forgiven, you know, and and unless you're Roman Catholic, you don't believe in penance um, to pay it back, and so yeah, uh, it needs to be forgiven. Then there's the whole question of um. Uh, Paul writing to Timothy and saying a pastor needs to be above reproach. Now, what this guy did, he did before he was a Christian. And so he was not a pastor at the time. You know, if he were a pastor at the time, that he would just be immediately disqualified and pretty yeah. much never, you know, go back to the mystery. But, you know, he wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a Christian. He became a Christian later. And, um, and, and that's how he copes with all this. And so, you know, I think there's a, a, a failure to really understand the extent of God's forgiveness. But yeah, it, you know, I, I don't know. Cause with this Davis, he seems, and, and of course now you got to remember, this is the spin of the story. You know, you never, you only get so much information. Um, yeah. But it, you know, it, it almost, it almost sounds like he's, he's gotten to the point where he's kind of flipping about it. And, you know, I'm sure that, that he's not okay. I'm sure that this, this haunts him. And it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's going to, it's going to haunt him the rest of his life. Um, you know, there's things that there's situations that I've been in, um, where I've said stupid things that, you know, either immediately after I said it or, or, you know, maybe it was a day or two later, it just kind of hit me like, Oh, that was that was about the stupidest thing I could have possibly said in that situation, and that stuff I know that God forgives me for that. Okay, I've spent a lot of time talking with God about it, and and I do firmly believe that He forgives me for that. But it still bugs me. Yeah. All right. Um, and you know, and and I use it. It I mean, it motivates me to make sure that I don't ever do it again. And and I, um, you know, based on the the information that we have here, have every reason to believe that, you know, this guy really, you know, he's taken oh, it I, to God and, and, uh, believes he's forgiven and, and, and you know, he's never going to do it again, you know? And, and to a certain extent, my, my, my hesitation with him might be my general, you know, lack of, um, affinity for sort of your slick mega church preacher. And, and I just assume they're sort of smarmy and corrupt, <laughs> which is, you know, sin on my part, but, <laughs> So this, but you know what, what this does show is, is the extent of what sin does. Yeah. All right. That sin destroys lives. All right. You know, whether it be, um, trying somebody, you know, with the, well, our first story talking about, um, same sex marriage and, and, you know, people wanting to have, um, love and, and all of the, the blessings that come with marriage, but who are just incapable of attaining that because of their body chemistry or whatever it is that causes it. All right. Well, that's the result of sin in the world. Okay. And, um, and you know, and it destroys their lives, right? It's destroying these people's lives. It's, it's horrible. All right. And people make such light of, you know, like, ice cream that's sinfully, you know, but it's sinfully cinnamon or something like that. And it's like, yeah, you know, I, I, and I think it, it turns out, I, I think most of us or most people, um, we, we make an equal mistake on, on either side. We, we take sin too lightly. We don't have a, a big enough understanding of sin, but we also take grace too lightly. And, and we don't have a big enough understanding of grace. And um, the, the the beauty of it, if we're able to sort of stretch out our our def 
initiative or on bandits a little bit, it allows for our, our, our thought about sin to grow. And, 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 you know, because the, the, the problem is, is as soon as we let sin grow without allowing grace to grow, then, then we begin to exclude ourselves and, and realize just how messed up we are, but we have no hope. Um, and, and so how can we, um, continually push bounds and so people can have a, not only a larger understanding of sin. I mean, to, to grasp how sinful and, and, and broken we are, but, but to, to have hope in the midst of that because of Christ and, and, and how beautiful the gospel and, and, and grace is. And, um, I don't know, I guess it's, it, it's odd because I, I'll, I'll talk about the fact that, you know, I have things happen to me all the time where it just reminds me of, of how depraved I am. Um, just, just little things and it'll stri- something will strike in my mind and I'll sit there and, wow, I am jacked up. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I'll be honest about that. And, oh, you're not that and, and people instantly try and make me feel better about it. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't try and make me feel better about it. Uh, that, that reminds me just how much I need Jesus. And, 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 and maybe in the process, it might help humble me just a bit because I need it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and that's what it comes down to is if we're not sinners, then we don't need Jesus, you know, mm-hmm. and we can, we can make it on our own. Right. But we know that's not true. You know, even an atheist will say nobody's perfect. Right. And, um, so it, yeah, being aware of your sin, it's a good thing. Um, because it, it does remind us how much we need his love, his forgiveness. But then we've always got to remember that we have his love and forgiveness that it's there for us. And, and he's given it to us. He has paid the price. You know, this, uh, Maury Davis, he didn't, you know, pay the price for his crime. Um, on, you know, arguably in an earthly sense, he should have been in prison longer. Okay. But more importantly, um, yeah, he should go to hell for that. Okay. Because all sin, um, is an act of, of treason against the kingdom of God. And so, yeah, we should go to hell for that. And and we need to understand that. That's, I mean, it's, is so serious that God himself had to pay in blood. And so, you know, once we understand that, then we can also recognize the amazing love and grace of God. And, and we realize how much he really does love us. So, yeah. A very nice brain. Well, I can't think of a better way to end a show. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about how huge the gospel is. <laughs> so, um, so thanks everybody for, uh, for tuning in again. I, again, I apologize for the sort of speed glitches. Um, but, uh, but we really are happy that you're here. Happy to have Joe on again. And, um, hopefully Jim will be back soon. And then, uh, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at podcast at crossbeatnews.com or if you're watching this on uh, YouTube or Rever or uh, one of the other uh, video sharing sites, you can just leave comments right there and we'll see those. Or you can, um, if you're watching this on uh, crossfeednews.com, there's a comment form uh, below that for general comments about the show. Or, you know, again, if you want to uh, send, there's also a feedback form on the site that you can use. There's lots of different ways to get a hold of us. So we would love to hear from you. So please do get a hold of us. So thanks everybody for tuning in or whatever, downloading, watching. And, um, <laughs> and bless you, Joe. Glad I didn't blow you out of that. <laughs> that would have been bad. <sighs> and good night, everybody, and God bless. All right, thanks for having me here again.